it's either way I need to be working on my customer experience. So yeah. for, for, for sure, if the best way to combat this and protect yourself for the future is to be so good that they can't ignore you, right? Um, so, and even if they don't do that, even if, even if the OEMs don't, you know, end up coming in and doing that, you still should be doing that. So it's not an it's either or scenario <laughs> here, but, but it's all the more reason that you should fear that and it should light some light a fire for you to really um, provide the best experience to your customers uh, in the world. Welcome to the Strategy with Jason podcast. Tune in for everything you need to know to stay in the know regarding the automotive industry. Here's your host, Jason Harris. Hey, 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 what's going on, Podcast Nation? It is Jason Harris here, and thank you for joining me on another episode of Strategy with Jason. Today we are in absolutely beautiful, sunny Napa Valley, California, at the amazing DMSC event hosted by just an amazing brother couple. <laughs> That's what I'm going to call them. I'm going to call them brother. <laughs> Glenn and Brian Pash. I have an amazing group here joining me on today's chat. I have Tiffany, Ryan, and Dean. Guys, thanks so much for taking the time to come jam with me. This is going to be a lot of fun. Thanks, Jason. Hey, for everybody out there who's listening and watching right now, I love kicking off these podcasts with a little origin story. A, because I'm always just fascinated to find out how people get into this island of misfit toys that I call the automotive industry. So, uh, Tiffany, I'll start with you and I'll work my way down to Dean. Tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got started in the automotive industry. Yeah, um, thanks. I, it's a funny story. I started out in sales. I did medical device sales for a long time. I decided I wanted to kind of get off the road and join a company a family. Um, I kind of fell into proactive dealer solutions. I started there as an account manager and just kind of working with and consulting with stores over how to, you know, convert their sales and service opportunities, how to manage their business development departments. Um, it all just went very natural for me. <laughs> for me, it all just made kind of common sense. Um, so I quickly just kind of worked my way up the ranks at Proactive, started as account management. Uh, I took over the account management department, moved into the sales team, took over the sales team, and now I am VP sales and operations. Been there just about eight years. Nice. Um, learned all things sales and service. I love working in automotive. I love talking to dealers <laughs> every day. Um, I don't know why, but we communicate well. Challenge. I'm a little crazy. That's what it is. I'm a little. <laughs> I'm a little direct, so it just, you know, it you works. You fit well in the automotive space. Yeah, it works. I love it. I'm always entertained, so it's been it's been a great eight years. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Hey, Ryan, for yourself, how did you get into the automotive industry? Sure. So I think a lot of us fell into the industry, um, as, as you mentioned, uh, or you had family in the industry. Yes. Uh, so for me, I was a, I was a lawyer. Um, and then did a, did a number of things, private equity and so forth, coming out of school the first few years, kind of bouncing around, figuring out what I want to do. And um, a family friend was starting Goo Goo, basically. Um, and we got involved. I got involved, um, you know, right at the beginning there, helping out with a few things while we were just getting off the ground. And then uh, when we had maybe a couple hundred dealers or so, um, took the leap to, uh, to jump into the business full time and uh, just grew it from there um, and uh, saw it from, you know, just maybe 20 employees up to now where we are uh, over 400. So wow. uh, it's been a, a hell of a journey. And, um, and uh, I think th there's a lot of really interesting problems to solve in automotive. Mm -hmm. And I mm -hmm. think that that's what sort of, um, yeah. you know, um, kept my my interest in it it's for, for right? all these years. Yeah. So, uh, it's been a great ride. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you, I'm glad it's in your blood now. Yeah. It's, I love that. Can't I'm, get it out. Yeah. I'm a lawyer and then I, <laughs> now, now, I'm, now I'm going to be in a, now I'm going to misfit. There we go. <laughs> yeah. Exactly right. Dean for yourself. How'd you get started? <laughs> well, I joined the misfits a long time ago too. Um, you know, I was fortunate enough. My first job really out of college was to go to work for Chrysler. So I was a sales and service rep for years. Um, I was fortunate enough then to kind of flip over and be the general manager of a Chrysler dealership when I was like 25, 26 years old in the Bay Area. Um, a, a wonderful owner named Phil Vogel, um, you know, believed in me. I was his rep and for years I was saying, look, you need a website, you need a BDC, you need to see a CRM. And he's like, a CR what? <laughs> what? 
And so that was a really great experience because I was there for about two years and we made that the number two Chrysler dealer in the United States in volume, um, all based off of internet and internet leads and all of that first passage. Uh, and then I was fortunate enough too to get recruited to go work for Land Rover. Um, I was their first digital um, marketing person that they ever had and my first assignment was pre-ordering these um, discoveries um, which was always great experience. Um, then I um, was fortunate enough to go to work for a company called Delix, um, which was kind of an auto by tell competitor at the time, and we started that pretty much from the ground up. Um, we were fortunate enough two years later, we sold that to the Cobalt Group. Um, that's what got me to the Cobalt Group for a few years. Because of being at the Cobalt Group, dealer.com called and said, look, we wanna be bigger than Cobalt <laughs> at the time. And I said, well, I think that's doable, so I'm moved out to Burlington, Vermont to be with all the cool dealer.comers. Um, it was great growth during that period of time. We had 200 dealers when I got there and when I left we had about 7,000. So we oh, became wow. the largest website provider yeah. in the world. Uh, because of that, um, I was recruited into Subaru um, because Subaru was dealer.com's best customer at the time. And so I was ushered into Subaru as the chief marketing officer there. Um, I was fortunate enough to be in that role for about three years, learned a lot. Um, the aha for me there was the auto industry was so fascinated with just marketing the car that they never built their brands. And yes. so Subaru, I think, is a really good example. And it was a they case a great study yes. of realizing that you need to do more than say it's $199, come down and buy it. You need to stand for love. You need to stand for something else. And so that was a really great marketing experience for me. Um, Subaru became the fastest growing brand in the United States that decade. They went from 200,000 a year to about 400,000 a year in about three years. Mm -hmm. uh, then I was fortunate enough to get recruited by Hyundai and I was a CMO there for about four years. Did some similar activity there. Uh, and then today I'm one of the co-founders of a company within the cars.com family called Fuel. And which we've built that and that's been a fast growing internal business for cars as well. So it's been what quite a, a trip. A, a, I can't keep a job. <laughs> the resume's long. Yes. But it was a very good learning experience in, in all of those cases. And I'm, I'm very fortunate enough to have had all those experiences for sure. That's awesome. And, and I can imagine throughout that time, you, you were in some very interesting parts of kind of automotive history. You went through the 08-09 recession. You saw that impacted uh, building out Subaru's brand. I agree with you. I mean, when I think of branding out of the OEM, mm -hmm. Subaru definitely is at the top there, I think, for just really wanting to connecting to the customer. And that's kind of a good segue into our topic because, you know, a, a lot of what we're hearing right now during this this uh, this conference is is meeting the customer where the customer wants wants to be met. I mean that's that's almost what it is, and how that affects the customer experience. And that's where, guys, I want to start today. Is the customer experience has just kind of fundamentally just changed in the last 24 months? I mean, I think of what's changed in the last 24 months. There was more changes uh, now than probably the entire decade combined prior to that. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'd like to kind of get guys' take on, is what were some of the biggest changes you saw to the customer experience in the last 24 months? Tiffany, I'll start with you. Um, yeah, I think that we, prior to COVID, we considered the customer experience when the customer was in the store only. Mm -hmm. Yes. And we didn't think about all the touch points that really occur before that. So you've got dealers, dealer groups that have BDCs, right? So you have a sales BDC. Well, that's just the team of people in the back and they just handle the leads and they're just trying to funnel traffic. And so the customer experience kind of starts and they show up. But now I think we've all really realized that there's so much to be done and so many touch points that you need to make really magical for the customer to encourage them to come in when they're ready, right? So I think that's probably the biggest change that we've seen. We work with an OEM and we're their training partner to um, help them implement their digital retailing software. And so we really focus on preparing the store, the management team, preparing the what we call influencers uh, on the sales floor in the BDC and in the internet department for this kind of culture shift that, mm -hmm. the, that they should be going through right now. So how do we create these moments of magic before the customer even shows up um, and I think that's the biggest shift we've seen is dealers starting to recognize, okay, we need to make some improvements in the experience before they get here so they <laughs> want to come here, right? So I think that's been really the biggest shift that I've seen most dealers go through is they're starting to recognize now how important that 
process experiences before the customer arrives. And, and that culture shift is absolutely impenetrable uh, for that to happen, right? When I think of culture shifts, I mean, not only did we have monster culture shifts, but we had some serious technology shifts. I mean, just the adoption of technology in the last 24 months is just so exponential. Ryan, I'd love to kind of get your take. Mm. What was one of the biggest observations you saw as far as uh, changes to the experience, customer Sure, experience? so I mean, at Goobagoo, uh, being uh, you know a leading digital retailing platform, when COVID started, obviously there was an explosion of kind of dealers uh, figuring out what that meant for them, mm. and um, you know inevitably that left led to I need to be able to sell cars online, right? Um, I think what what I've seen over the last two years is that the progressive dealer groups, the big dealer groups, have been moving more aggressively toward end-to-end -to -end transactions. So being able to provide a full transactional experience online, even if the reality is that 90% of those customers aren't going to do the full deal online. Mm -hmm. They don't, they, they, they want to serve those 10%, but also that experience is going to be better for the 90% if you can do the full experience online and have that same experience in the store. So I've seen a, a tremendous amount of progression from the big dealer groups. And I would, you know, I would guess that over history, it's usually the bigger groups uh, the, the ones who are better resourced that are leading the charge with when it was websites or when it was you know, novel marketing strategies or whatever it was, right? They were the ones who were sort of leading the charge. So I think that we're going to see a lot of dealers uh, moving m further toward that. And I think that, that um, that's what we're seeing. That's what we're seeing now. And, um, and, you know, messaging is a big part of that, of course. Of course. That's deep in our philosophy is that uh, your online experience uh, needs to be uh, needs to have messaging at its core, and I think the the last point I want to mention is the road to the sale. You know, the road to the sale was the way that the dealer wanted to sell, right? And today, I think we're seeing a lot of a change in philosophy mm -hmm. that with with the dealers saying maybe the way to sell is the way that the customer wants to buy, and I think 100%. that I'm I'm really hopeful. It, that because I've been on a mission for for eight years to to drive this customer experience, I'm really hopeful that that rings true and that dealers are really doing that. I, I'm with you 100. I think the last 24 months has really kind of uh, pounded down the final nail in the coffin that is the sales process. And you know you're seeing the most proactive dealers out there build out buying processes, and not just one. You could have six. You could possibly have a dozen different ways now to buy. And I, I'm with you. And I'm really hopeful that that fundamental change or that snowball effect keeps going. Absolutely, Dean. For yourself, what was one of the biggest observations you kind of saw that changes to the customer experience? Yeah, I'm, I agree with what Tiffany was saying there a minute ago. It's beyond what happens in the box or in the showroom. Mm -hmm. And I would also um, add to. I think even before this 24-hour COVID period, there was also a period before that which I call the CarMax period. And which is, you know, we at Hyundai um, saw that coming and we launched something called Hyundai Shopper Assurance mm -hmm. like about four years ago. And it was really about giving the customer pricing transparency before they got to the store. It was about remote test drives. It was about a four day money or a four day money back guarantee, which was a little <gasps> for the Hyundai dealers at first. <laughs> but they realize now today, I think CarMax has a 30 day money back guarantee. So the point is, I think all of that started happening before COVID mm -hmm. because of some of these used car, super big stores, like mm -hmm. you were saying, driving this change. But it wasn't really till COVID that all the masses decided, wow, I either can't sell a car or I've got to learn how to remote sell this <laughs> or I'm not going to be yep. a required business to stay open. And I know what cars, one of the things that was really impressive is I think it was March of 2020. We kind of all went home and we all said, oh, my gosh, we have to work from home, including <laughs> dealers and everyone. But then we quickly said, look, we have this little badge that you can put on your VDP, which says you have a remote test drive or remote sales capability. Well, I was blown away that in a week we had like 5,000 dealers say, yes, I do this. Wow. To me, that was the one of the biggest moments in time where like 5,000 dealers have all decided they're going to do remote selling. And so it really put the power back into the digital retailing solutions from something that was novel on their website to this has to be our OS operating system mm -hmm. moving forward. And so I agree with everyone saying here, I would just add that it's been about five years in making, mm. but COVID really kind of put the stake in the ground, and now we're off to the races. It, it definitely fast-tracked it yes. in, in, in a huge way, right? And 
I get really excited when I see this much change happen, but then there's the part of me, and maybe this is the old dealer principle coming out, well, how much <laughs> of that can I actually make stick, you know? Like I know when, I, when I'm training my team, when I was training my staff, right, there are only so many processes that I can throw out them at any given moment knowing that a percentage of them is gonna stick and then some of them are just gonna, they're gonna have to be kind of retrained, reinstalled over yep. a period of time. The warning coming, Carvana's broke. <laughs> so as a dealer principal, <laughs> I think what you're thinking, <laughs> or close to it. What everyone is thinking, I think, is, okay, well, you can't really make money with that new modern model. Mm. So do I, as a retailer now, get to kind of go back a little bit to say, look, and now with supply and demand, yes. the other day it was funny, I was watching a dealer's website looking at this Escalade I wanted, and it went from call me for a price to you've got to come into my dealership to sit oh, yeah. here before I give you a price. Now, I would argue before we are all cheering up and down that we have evolved and now we're into this new world, I think there's some dynamics kind of bringing us back to a more traditional place. So I guess no, that's a great we I will see where things kind of lend up. Well, yeah, I, I think that's a good segue because from a process perspective, how do we make that stick? And then Ryan, maybe I'll ask you from a tech perspective. So. I, I totally agree. I think obviously with the shortage that we're experiencing, we're, uh, the stores are getting away with reverting back to the old way of doing things, right? Well, I don't really need to do this right now. Like the, I have the vehicle, the customer will come in, I can charge them what I want to. And we're forgetting all that we learned over the last two years. Um, so how do you make that stick? I think it really has to start with mid-level management. I mean, you have to focus on your managers. And there was um, a session that we listened to yesterday where they talked about, um, you know, the best time to fix your roof is when it's shun uh, sun shining out. <laughs> and I think that is such a good like point that. for us to think about. Yes, things are good right now. We're making money. Um, we don't have a lot of vehicles. Maybe we're not like slam packed busy with a bunch of people on the showroom floor, but what a better time to really focus on training and implementing process. We have the time to do it. We're doing really well. Let's reset and prepare for, cause I agree. I don't think that inventory levels are going to change, you know, Anytime very soon. soon. <laughs> but why not start to prepare for that now? So when we do get you know, busy again, when we do have cars again, we're prepared for how to handle all of that. And I think it has to start with managers. The stores that continue to uh, 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 execute on the processes that we're implementing are the ones that the mid-level management team is on board and driving that change. And I think the only way you get your mid-level management, your sales managers, your influencers on the floor in the BDC in any department is to make them a part of the process of changing it Ooh, there we go right like so yeah. we we do a, um, an exercise at proactive with all of our stores um, and we do a customer experience mapping session and we'll pull in all of the key people from the dealership and we'll sit down and we will go through what are what is your customer experience today phone internet floor chat what's happening right now how do we plus those up and then we get those managers to participate. Like, what would you want to see as a customer? How would you do this here? And once they have that ability to build out a process that they buy into, they're more likely to execute on it and continue to manage it moving forward. Right? No, so I think that's the biggest piece. Right. I mean, look, we've been, we, we, we did it for the last 24 months because we had to, mm -hmm. right? And now since there are options, all right, how do we continue to maintain those good habits? And I think technology plays a big part of that, of maintaining the stickiness of that process. But Ryan, I'd love to get your thoughts. Yeah, yeah sure. So just to go back to what uh, Dean was saying, we're not there yet. So we're all saying here that <laughs> dealers are changing and all this. We're definitely not there yet. I good mean, point. there's still a lot of fear of change and providing too much control and transparency. And I see it a lot and it really pisses me off. But to give you an example, I mean, we have a, you know, in building out our virtual retail experience, one of the key features to complete a deal is is uh, real-time uh, decisions from lenders, right? So you submit a credit app, mm -hmm. you get decisions back, approved, not approved, you see the rate and all this. Um, we have less than half of our dealers that are enabling that. So I dig into, hey, why, why are they not enabling that? And the reason that a lot of dealers aren't enabling is because they don't want to provide a real rate to the customer online because they think that customer is then going to go shop it 
and you know they won't end up buying a car. So they want to get you in the store where it's harder for you to leave, right? <laughs> and so we're definitely not there yet. But to bring it back to sort of the big groups and all that, you know, and, and how we how we get there. Uh, I was at the Asbury AGM, and and they have a very clear mission to provide the best guest experience on earth, mm -hmm. right? It's not to be the most profitable dealer group. It's not to sell the most cards. It's not to have the highest grosses. Now, of course, those things will come, right? But they have a strong core belief that those will come by building the best guest experiences. So I think that the way that you do enable that customer centric experience is by imbuing that from the top, having a clear mission that is focused on the experience, that is focused on the customer, and that um, that people can use as a guiding compass within your organization to say, is this best for the customer? Is is this best for the customer? And and the it has to start with leadership, and they have to continue to um, to enforce that. Mm -hmm. And one more thing, I heard. Um, I was on a call also with with Asbury, and I heard them say, "I don't give a damn if it's if it's good for us as long as it's good for the customer. If it's Whoa. good for the customer, <laughs> it is, is good awesome. for us." And yes. so I think that there's, that's inspiring, and it's something that people can get behind in the dealership. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what? I, I, you're 100 percent right. Um, I think this is an amazing time for some of the most proactive dealers out there that may be watching and listening to kind of maybe reevaluate their vision or mission statements. Or if the, you don't have one, this is an amazing time to do that because it gives direction to the way we process and the way we utilize technology. But I'd love to get your thoughts on that too, Dean. Yeah, no, I think <clears throat> to add to that, there's one element called the OEM. <laughs> oh no! Uh, that's going to add to the whole. What are we going to do here? And and you know we heard it at the beginning of the weekend with Brian and I agree. And I don't know if you saw the headlines this morning. Mercedes already kind of put the gauntlet down this morning mm -hmm. by saying that. in Europe, your delivery points now. <laughs> and so all I was saying is is r r saying what Ryan was saying is if if we're not good at the process part, <laughs> they're taking the other stuff away. They don't want you negotiating. They don't want you in the box. They want it to be an iPad. They want all of those elements to come in. And here's the good part to that. That will keep rolling if supply doesn't come. Mm -hmm. But here's, I think, the wild card. There's no OPEC in automotive. Now, some of them think there is without any names and brands <laughs> and CEOs mentioned. I think I know you're talking about. <laughs> but then there's other CEOs in the world, in the East, that realize this is their market share opportunity they've been waiting for their whole lives and they're gonna build a lot of cars in Q4. And I've been saying for a while, if you have 10 Palisades on your lot and the Ford dealer has no Explorers on their lot, but you have to order the Explorer, but you got 10 Palisades ready to roll, okay, those 10 are gonna disappear before the order of, so that is the no OPEC in automotive I'm referring to. So I predict that you're gonna start getting volume back from some OEMs, that's gonna chase other OEMs to start building ahead of an order for stock. Remember that? You'd build mm -hmm. for stock, stock and you'd yes. wholesale those cars <laughs> and that's what gave all those OEM reps something to do was to really manage that. I think there is some of that coming back because I do think some OEMs believe in that model more than ever before. And so I do think that's those are some of the dynamics we have to watch, that the OEM is going to be making you do these things to become and continue to be a relevant point for them. Yeah, that is that is a whole podcast topic, I think, literally in itself, and I absolutely love it, but I'd love to kind of get your guys' thought on this. The potential of OEMs really taking their dealer body and turning them just into delivery points. We're seeing it happen. There's definitely a lot of chat about it. I'd love to kind of get your guys' thoughts of how that would affect a dealer. Tiffany, I'll start with you and Ronald, I see the same. Um, well, I think that it's certainly possible. It's obviously happening in Europe already. Um, so if it does happen, how does it affect the dealership? I think that we, we're going to have to, I mean, our sales floors are going to be a lot smaller. We're going to have to look a lot more at service if that happens, focus um, a lot more on that customer experience that I think it is usually ignored. Um, and we're going to have to kind of get rid of the idea of the traditional salesperson that they have now, right? Where they're not really going to exist anymore. They're going to be product specialists, client advisors. They're going to be 
what I think we're used to in BDC agents, um, but not outbound focus, more order taker focused, right? It's going to be like shopping for furniture. Exactly. We it's go into a showroom. I like that couch. That's the one I want. I want it in this color, that fabric, this depth, and ship it to me in however many months it takes to get it. And I think the important part is that the proactive dealers out there that are watching, listening right now, is that you don't want to just stick your fingers in your ears and go, la, 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 <laughs> not listening to this, but at least start having the conversation of what that would look like to your operations, you know? I, I would rather kind of have an oh shit plan sitting in my desk, go like, yes. okay, I guess my OEM is doing this. Let me pull out that plan we put together and figure out what we're doing next. But Ryan, I'd love to get your thoughts. Yeah, I think, I mean, absolutely you need to prepare for this. We've seen, <laughs> we've seen what happened in Europe. We've seen... Uh, the OEMs trying to bifurcate the type of vehicle that's being sold and trying to go direct. And why are they doing that? Because uh, they feel that obviously the value that the dealer pr is providing is not there, right? And for whatever reason, right? But mm -hmm. it doesn't really matter because I can see you. <laughs> I've got a good answer. Yeah. For this. <laughs> it, it doesn't really matter because either way, I need to be working on my customer experience. So, yeah. For, for, for sure, if the best way to combat this and protect yourself for the future is to be so good that they can't ignore you, right? Um, so, and even if they don't do that, even if, even if the OEMs don't you know, end up coming in and, and doing that, you still should be doing that. So it's not an it's either or scenario <laughs> yes. here, but, but it's all the more reason that you should fear that and it should light some light a fire for you to really um, provide the best experience to your customers uh, in the world. Absolutely, I know Dean, you'd like to add to it. If I was adding to that oh shit plan <laughs> that you're yes. pulling out, yes. the one thing I would say is this, think about this for a minute. We sell about, in a normal year, 17 million new cars in the United States. Mm -hmm. What do you think, and I'll ask you guys, what do you think the number would be if every OEM just had a kiosk in a mall? Uh, it wouldn't be 17 no, million be anymore. Yeah, It'd be much less. Much less. Yeah, and so I think the big aha that all the OEMs are missing is they're really living in the 20, last 24 months. Yeah. Mm. Without yeah. living in this mm. concept where what yeah. happens if there's less demand than supply again? Yeah. And I agree with you, Tiffany. Baseline is you better be doing the good customer experience work. But if you you better be conquesting sales for that OEM. 100%. If you're if you're a Hyundai dealer and you're conquesting the heck out of the Ford store across town, the OEM isn't going to be so quick to say, "Hey, I just want you to be a delivery center." <laughs> That's a good. No, no, no. Yeah. I want That's you to Ryan be the saying. sales yes. force behind the brand. And I think mm -hmm. we've all kind of forgot, and some of the OEMs have forgotten about that as they're like, "Okay, no, the kiosk in the mall is the new salesperson." Mm -hmm. I'm not going to list domestic luxury brands that that's where their center force is. If you go to every mall, you see that brand there, but they're full of models helping you push the buttons on the kiosk. And then when you say, well, that's all I need today. They're like, okay, bye. Okay. They're walking people all day long. Yes. And in that environment where we are today, it's fine. But when you have more supply than demand again, to me, the recommendation on the plan is be a good sales point for the brand, mm -hmm. not I, just experience. Yeah, and to add to this notion that we think the last 24 months is the world going forward, right? Yeah. And to and, and your point about um, our consumers going to be okay waiting for cars when one or two OEMs have cars ready now. Exactly. And I don't think they, I don't think consumers are going to be okay with that. They're going to go buy the car now because they've got to make their trips this summer and they had a kid and now they need to upsize their car and they can't wait four months to get that new car, which by the way, there's probably not that much differentiation mm -hmm. between that escape and the sportage or whatever it is. Right. Yeah, so no, I'm going to take makes what's a bad coming car now. That's, That's right. Well, it's that in the long. fact yeah. that we're, it's that in the fact that we're all incredibly impatient too. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. If American Amazon consumers. has done anything to us, <laughs> yeah. it is the fact that we Instant. get what we ordered in the next one to two days. I mean, that's why, you know, Instant gratification. that's yep. why I love Amazon. <laughs> so if somebody has something, I'm going to want what's available. Yes. Being a great sales organization 
it, that, uh, all the more reason you got to focus in service too. If you're yeah, pulling out that point. ocean, yes. that ocean <laughs> plan, right? <laughs> yes. It's looking at our service operation and how do we leverage that to sell more when the supply is back, right? So that's something that we used to do. We used to teach. We used to have a process for. We used to have a manager that was responsible for. And I think looking back at that process, that service to sales process is going to be incredibly important especially all the direct to ev <laughs> brands now like oh yes. i mean they're all like oh you mean these things have to be serviced <laughs> wait a second as what all of these do? boutiques in the mall that just sell you something but where do you take all these cars back mm -hmm. and so again the traditional network is really still in the power seat because of service and i got to know how to sell cars as long as we create a great experience that's what that's what it kind of comes yes. down to right we can't give the OEM a reason to turn us into a delivery. Now, look, I understand there's a lot of other politics that go into it. So if you're out there watching, I understand <laughs> yes, there's a lot exactly. more that goes into this, <laughs> yes. right? But but no, we, we do need to have those plans. Those plans need to be in place. The conversations need to be had. And we need to be proactive in our preparation to ensure that, you know, our, our, our way of selling cars and our customers continue to survive. Guys, this has been a great conversation. I know we're towards the tail end of it. And I, and I love the topic, by the way. I think it could literally be a whole podcast on its <laughs> yes. own. Um, but before I let you guys go, for everybody out there that's watching and listening right now, I would maybe love to connect with you. What's the best way to connect with you? Tiffany, I'll start with you. Um, oh, geez. Uh, you can reach out to me directly at Proactive Dealer Solutions. Um, Tiffany Peeler on LinkedIn uh, is always an easy way. Um, or a tpeeler at proactivedealersolutions.com. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, well, we're at goobagoo.com. Uh, to connect with me, uh, best way is LinkedIn, Ryan Austin, uh, or Twitter. Nice. Ryan Austin oh. as well. So, I know it's not like a thing in automotive, but no, oh, I just, no, yeah, it is, yeah, but it's not as much, you know. So anyway, but yeah. <laughs> Dean, what's the best I, way? I just have a cell phone. <laughs> you can call me. No, <laughs> no, D Evans at Cars um, and at LinkedIn as well. Awesome. Hey, guys, thank you so much for taking the time to jam with me. This has been thanks, a lot guys. of fun. Yes. Yeah, thanks for yeah, having us. Thanks, Jason. Thank thanks. you, guys. Pleasure. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for tuning in to the Strategy with Jason podcast with your host, Jason Harris. Don't want to miss new content? Be sure to check out the full podcast library at strategywithjason.com to stay in the know. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Happy podcasting.